Way down yonder in Vietnam Put down your books and pick up a gun We're gonna have a whole lot of fun And it's one, two, three What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn The next stop is Vietnam And it's five, six, seven Open up the pearly gates Well, there ain't no time to wonder why We're all gonna die Now come on, Wall Street, don't be slow I man this is war a go-go There's plenty good money to be made Supplying the army with the tools of the trade Just hope and pray that if they drop the bomb We're dropping on the Viet Cong And it's one, two, three What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn The next stop is Vietnam And it's five, six, seven Open up the pearly gates Well, ain't no time to wonder why We'll be all gonna die Now come on, generals, let's move fast Your big chance is here at last Now you can go out and get those reds Cause the only good commie is one that's dead And you know that peace can only be one When they're blowing them all the kingdom comes Sing it! One, two, three What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, don't give it down Louder! Vietnam And it's five, six, seven Open up the bird again Well, I ain't no time to wonder why We'll be all gone Listen, people, I don't know how you expect to ever stop the war if you can't sing any better than that. There's about 300,000 of you fuckers out there. I want you to start singing. Come on. And it's one, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. The next stop is Vietnam. And it's five, six, seven. We're open up the curly gates. Well, I ain't no time to wonder why. We're all gonna die. Now come on, mothers about the land. Pack your boys off to Vietnam. Come on, fathers, don't hesitate to send your sons off before it's too late. Be the first one on your block, have your block and on in the box. All right! One, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. The next stop is Vietnam. And it's five, six, seven. What are we fighting for? So welcome to lesson six, uh, topic five, Vietnam, a success or failure of containment. That was the fixing to die rag by country Joe McDonald famously sang at the Woodstock uh, Peace, Love and Freedom concert uh, in the summer of 1969. It is probably one of the most profound and one of a number of anti-war songs uh, that were popular, popularized by American youth at this particular time as a protest to what they saw um, as a war that was unjust, one that shouldn't be fought, and one that they wanted to end right away. Um, we'll get into why that all is um, as we go through this, but we're picking up on our last lesson. As American uh, uh, involvement under Vietnam increases, uh, Lyndon Johnson becomes increasingly more unpopular. Now, the Vietnam War is one of the more interesting uh, engagements in American history. And it's in fact, really the only engagement in which America can be decisively defeated in this particular time. And it is in all, of, uh, in for all intents and purposes, an absolute disaster for the policy of containment. The real beginning of the end in Vietnam, the thing that really sparks the uh, anti-war movement is what's known as the Tet Offensive of 1968. Um, the Tet is the New Year's, so it's in, in effect the New Year's event offensive, and it takes place obviously on New Year's, January 1968. Um, North Vietnamese troops surprised 30 American targets, both civilian and military, and dozens of cities in Vietnam um, with a surprise attack on a holiday um, to try and overwhelm the American forces and get them out of Vietnam. Though none of these attacks succeeded, in fact, the Tet Offensive militarily is an absolute failure for the North and Vietnamese. What it does succeed is in showing that the, after, well, really, after three or four years of intense American involvement, tens of thousands of American lives lost, the North Vietnamese are no closer to giving up. And 
even though they lose the North Vietnamese, it's a complete disaster for the Americans who are actually technically the military winners of this. The American media really begins to turn, sensing that the zeitgeist, the, felt, the feeling of the people back home are turning, and starting to question whether or not American soldiers need to be in Vietnam in such mem uh, numbers. The American media starts to question uh, whether or not America can ever win in Vietnam, and they start to characterize the conflict as a defeat. Um, Lyndon Johnson famously says, when the famous American um, uh, news anchorman, Walter Cronkite, is over in Vietnam, and he starts to criticize the war. Walter Cronkite's famous. Walter Cronkite um, is probably the most well-known news anchor in America, one of the most famous personalities in America. And he's doing the coverage live in Vietnam, wearing an American Army uniform during the Tet Offensive. And he starts to characterize the Americans' uh, effort as a defeat because of just how resilient the North and Vietnamese seem to be. And Lyndon Johnson famously says to an aide, if I've lost Walter Cronkite, I've lost the American people. And this really is the beginning of the end for the American war effort, which goes from uh, disaster to disaster all the way through until the eventual withdrawal and peace treaty in the, er, in the early to mid-1970s. Now, the public support for the war, of course, as a result of all this, begins to plummet severely in 1968. And this is heavily influenced by... Um, things the Americans do on their own. The Americans get involved in what, uh, a lot of scandals, and perhaps the greatest scandal of this era is known as the My Lai Massacre. And it's a response to the Tet Offensive. And in the My Lai Massacre, a small handful of American soldiers, uh, out of revenge for being ambushed on New Year's Eve in their bases, go into a Vietnamese village supposedly friendly to the Vietnamese and kill hundreds of unarmed Vietnamese civilians. These include women and children. And this town, of course, was called Mai Lai, and hence the name Mai Lai Massacre. And this massacre is widely covered by the American media, who sees upon this to show that not only are we losing this war, it's frustrating our soldiers. And not only that, we are the baddies in this conflict. Okay, the Americans weren't used to seeing themselves as the baddies. The propaganda of the Cold War is always us. We're the good guys, them, the communists, they're the evil people. Now, TV is a relatively new medium. Every American has one in its home. And really, the American army didn't understand the impact TV would have. And when TV starts showing the impact, uh, massacres, Americans start to, you know, change their opinion of the war. Americans always, uh, and you know, any country involved in a war gets involved in um, shady activity. And this is not a uniquely an American trend, but cert what's certainly different about Vietnam and what's certainly different about my Lai is it's never been shown on TV before, so people could easily ignore it. Now, you sit down to the six o'clock news and there's a massacre committed by the people on your street or the, the people just like you, Americans just like you, the good guys, it starts to undermine the war effort. And of course, the really the course of the war and whether or not to get out of Vietnam, cut our losses and run, really becomes the, um, uh, the big issue of the 1968 presidential election. Johnson is so unpopular because of the Vietnam War that he actually decides not to run again for re-election, even though he was entitled to run for an additional term, which is a really an almost unprecedented move. It's very rare that a sitting president refuses to run again. Uh, it happens in, in the case of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it happens in the case of, uh, well, as we'll see a little bit later, Richard Nixon. But um, it, it, this is a really unusual move. The Democratic Party in which he represents is split, split down the middle. Um, their convention in which they choose the leader in 1968 is a very interesting story amongst itself and something worth really getting into. But really, it devolves into an anti-war protest. As one half of the Democratic, Democratic Party wants to get out of the war and another half wants to stay in. And what happens in the end, which leads to even greater protests, is that in the convention, the delegates, the elites, if you will, decide that the pro-war okay, candidate is going to win, Herbert Humphrey. And Herbert Humphrey goes up in the 1968 election against this individual, Richard Nixon. And the unpopularity of Johnson, Humphrey, and the Democratic Party leads to a sweeping victory of Richard Nixon in the 1968 presidential election. Nixon, in his promises and in the campaign, actually says that he will begin to withdraw U.S. troops from Vietnam. And his slogan for his campaign becomes, Peace with Honor. Um, 
to do this when Nixon becomes president, he actually sort of backtracks and he, he his peace with honor very much looks like that's increase the pressure on the war to force the people to negotiate. And he pursues a policy of what he calls Vietnamization. He says that the South Vietnamese would be supported with material and money by the U.S., but they would be doing most of the fighting. By 1970, 350,000 American troops are in Vietnam, but by September 1972, there are only 40,000. Now, you might be saying, Mr. Range, just a second ago, you said he increased the American involvement in Vietnam. Well, yes, he does. And I'm going to explain to you how that happens right now. Nixon, between 1969 and 1972, had tried to negotiate peace, but the talks failed. The Vietnamese would not negotiate peace with the Americans. They felt that they could win the war and they were going to win over outright victory. So what he does is, in order to force them is he um, starts bombing North Vietnamese bases in the neighboring country of Cambodia. Now, why does this make sense? Why bomb a next, another country? Why not just bomb the North Vietnam, where the North Vietnamese are? Well, the thing is, the Americans were bombing North Vietnam. Vietnam. They had been since the night, early part of the 1960s, and North Vietnam was not a safe place for the Vietnamese army to hide. The next a uh, neighboring country, uh, Cambodia, had gone communist in the meantime. It was led by a group called the Khmer Rouge, who um, were a terribly horrendous terrorist communist organization who massacred uh, thousands and thousands of their own people. But during the Vietnam War, they're also anti-American, and they allow the North Vietnamese troops to hide on the border of South Vietnam along the Cambodian border, and then in, at night, in secret, cross the border and then attack American troops there. So Nixon says that if you're going to do that, I'm going to bomb Cambodia. So Nixon, instead of decreasing uh, American involvement, actually invades another country. So not the Vietnam War isn't just in Vietnam anymore, it's in Cambodia, and he's raiding Cambodia. Um, and he does tries to do this in secret to avoid international attention, but it fails. And the bombing of Cambodia fails to destroy the North Vietnamese as well. So instead of all of this, he decides to send in some more troops to complete the mission. And America is now at war, technically, with Vietnam and Cambodia at the same time. And this escalation of the war is so poorly received at home that it breaks out in the summer of 1970 in protests nationwide. The worst protest, uh, well, in terms of uh, its results, are the ones that take place in Kent State University, which is in Ohio. It's not far from the city of Cleveland, Ohio, in the northeastern corner of the state on Lake Erie. And Kent State University is a strongly anti-war campus. And on this campus, there's a humongous demonstration of students. And it gets so out of hand that the government calls in the National Guard, a paramilitary group, to basically come in and put this protest down. Now, when the National Guard arrives at Kent State, American protesters are sticking flowers in the butt of their rifles. Some American uh, National Guardsmen panic and think that they're about to be attacked by the students and open fire. And when they open fire on the American students in Kent State, there are four um, innocent protesters, unarmed, shot on an American college campus. And this is really the end of the Vietnam War in many ways, because once Americans start being killed on college campuses by Americans over the war, the president needs to get out of here quick. And the Kent State Massacre, as you can see by this, one of the most famous pictures of the 20th century here on the right, um, was a real turning point. And by 1973, uh, the president is actively involved in peace talks in Vietnam. The 1973 peace treaty is signed between the Americans, actually is brokered by the Russians and the Vietnamese, and it promised an American withdrawal of Vietnamese, which would lead to a brief peace between the North and the South, and basically a drawing of the lines. However, when the Americans pull out in 1973, in 1974, and 1975, the North Vietnamese re-enter Vietnam, South Vietnam, with force and capture the entire country of Vietnam. So after a decade's worth of fighting, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of American lives, um, and a war that cost the Americans billions of dollars, and a, and a peace treaty that was ignored, 
Vietnam falls eventually to the communists. And the picture is another one of those famous pictures of the 20th century. This is evacuees being helped out of the American embassy onto an American helicopter as the capital of the South Saigon is being captured by the North Vietnamese. Within one hour of this photo, the US embassy would be entirely overrun and occupied by the North Vietnamese communist forces, signaling very symbolically the end to the American policy of containment in Vietnam. Now, we're going to evaluate here why did the U.S. withdraw from the war and why did the policy of containment fail? So let's deal with the first question first. So why did the USA withdraw from this war? Well, the first one, of course, is public opinion. The mood in America had changed largely because of the media. They highlighted scandals like My Lai. Others included the use of Agent Orange, which is a chemical exfoliant meant to uh, take the leaves off the trees so that the um, uh, Vietnamese hiding in the jungle could be easily seen by American planes and American soldiers on the ground. Well, Agent Orange, when dropped on people, causes horrific uh, forms of skin cancer and tumors. Not to mention the fact that American soldiers who were in the jungle at the time when Agent Orange was dropped got um, Agent Orange on them. And many soldiers died not as a result of being shot or killed or injured in the war, but they died because of the uh, exposure to American chemicals such as Agent Orange. So these types of scandals really undermine the war effort. After the Tet Offensive, of course, the U.S. media basically concludes that the war would take more effort over a longer period of time than it was worth and starts to promote the idea which catches on with the American citizens that the war isn't worth it. Not only the, the, that, there was the fact that American soldiers were drafted into the military. The, as I sort of mentioned previously, the soldiers um, who were of good fighting age, over the age of 18, were drafted into the military against their will to fight this war because the American army needed so many more men. The war cost billions of dollars at a time when the American economy was slowing to a certain degree. And again, that change of attitude towards intervention led to a large peace movement that developed. In 1968, there are 100 demonstrations against the war. And during these demonstrations, people would do unthinkable things for Americans, like burn the flag, taunt the president, burn pictures of the president. In November 1969, 700,000 people march to, on Washington, D.C. to protest the Vietnam War. This is the largest political protest in American history. Um, the North Vietnamese also employ really effective tactics against the Americans. Okay? The U.S. in every way is better armed, better trained, better equipped. Their weaponry is the best weaponry in the entire world. However, they weren't trained to fight in the jungle. They weren't trained to fight against guerrilla-style warfare in a territory they were unfamiliar with in a climate that they quite frankly hated. Um, this war wasn't fought in large set-piece battles. There were no tanks used in any great way. This, it, uh, the war was fought in a way that America wasn't prepared to fight it. The Vietnamese would use surprise attacks at irregular times. They would hide in tunnels under the ground, seemingly for months at a time, and never pop out. The Americans didn't know where their enemy was. There was never real evidence of any progress. Things that were taken by the Americans would fall back into the Vietnamese hands as soon as the Americans left. I'm thinking of a village, for instance. Um, and not only that, the Americans were really poor at winning the hearts and minds of the people. Of course, the scandals, such as My Lai, didn't help. But the people... Um, uh, started to admire the Viet Cong, not only for their resilience, but for the fact that this they were doing something Vietnamese, and this was a national movement, that they were going to do this for themselves. And even though communism might not have been overwhelmingly popular with some people in the South, it was at least Vietnamese. And they resented the fact that this large Western power was going to come over here and tell them what to do. So they started to lose the people, and eventually Americans found themselves unsafe anywhere they go. There are lots of stories of American soldiers who are on leave, they're in the city of Saigon, and they're murdered in the streets by Vietnamese civilians. So it was a really unsafe place to be, and it's just eventually you got this idea that this is either going to go on forever, but it's not only going to go on forever, it's just going to be horrible getting there. So we have a, a lot of this um, happening. Now, let's take a look at the policy of containment. Now, Americans losing, in effect, the Vietnam War was a disaster for containment. They failed the military mission. Okay? It showed that even though the Americans had this incredibly vast military, it couldn't contain communism everywhere it wanted to. It could in some cases, but certainly not everywhere. The U.S. failed to stop Vietnam from going communist, and it really 
was the end of the policy of containment. They couldn't do it. Um, the bombing of Vietnam's neighbors, such as Cambodia under Nixon, even turned more of Vietnam's neighbors communist. Laos, which also neighbors Vietnam, goes communist. Cambodia goes communist. And in fact, American policy of containment in, far in Vietnam actually speeds up the domino effect and increases the amount of communist states in Southeast Asia. It's also a propaganda disaster. The U.S. had always presented themselves in the Cold War as the moral good guys and not the baddies. The Russians are the baddies. But, you know, this was a, a good and evil struggle. However, Vietnam made people question if they weren't the baddies after all. Okay, The atrocities committed in the war, the use of chemical weapons, as I had talked about, damaged the United States' reputation as the good guys around the world. You have protests against the Vietnam War in Paris, a huge one in Grosvenor Square at, in front of the U.S. Embassy in London that gets violent and out of hand. And some of their allies start to question whether or not America is actually acting for the good of the people and whether they should just let things be. The U.S. are also seen to be propping up governments that didn't have the support of its own people. And those, you know, people who believe in self-determination and democracy and these things um, uh, are, are horrified by the fact that the U.S. action is, in Vietnam is preventing a government, a communist government, that the majority of Vietnamese want in both the North and the South from actually taking legitimate power in their own country of the Vietnamese. So you see that containment really loses in three massive ways here. Um, additionally, the Vietnam War, as I said, is really an end to containment. It really shifts America's policy away from containment, which had been the strategy since the Truman Doctrine in the um, post-World War II era, of course, we're talking 1947. So between 1947 and 1975, and the fall of Vietnam, the policy of containment had to been American policy, but after the Vietnam War was over, the Americans go about trying to improve relations with China, a huge communist country. Richard Nixon will become the first American president to visit China in a very famous visit in the early 1970s. Um, they will allow China into the, e into the UN, and you recall that that was an issue in some ways that prompted uh, China's entry into the Korean War. So finally, after fighting both the Korean War and in Vietnam, the Americans reneged on, on their policy of keeping China out of the United Nations. The U.S. enters a period of greater understanding with the USR called detente. It's a French word, which means a relaxing of tensions. And it's fact, true to say that the USSR and China respectively get on with America better than they do themselves, because the USSR and China fall out in the late, in the, well, they fall out about the mid-1960s and really don't repair their relationship in any way, shape, and form going forward. It's even true to some degree today. And of course, the U.S. will become very suspicious and very hesitant to get involved in wars from this particular point forward. In fact, the U.S. will not really get involved in a large way in another war until the Persian Gulf War of 1991. Vietnam is such a blow to the American uh, pride, if you will, that they will almost not get involved in conflicts, where they had seemingly been ready to get involved in conflicts across the world up until this point, the Americans sort of back out, and they won't get involved in conflicts unless they can easily, quickly, and overwhelmingly win. The Americans will fight a few small wars. They'll invade Grenada in the 1980s, for example, um, again, with the hope of overthrowing a, a communist-style dictator. But Grenada is a small island, and it's quite easy to overthrow a dictator there. And they could easily, quickly, and overwhelmingly win. But they don't get involved in something like Vietnam ever again. And even if you look at the Cold War, sorry, the Gulf War, that's a relatively easy, quick, and overwhelming victory for the American coalition forces in 1991. But that's a topic, that's a discussion for topic seven. So this is the end of the policy of containment. So did the U.S. and were they successful in their policy of containment? Well, it lasted a while. And for the first little while, you can say that, you know, with some detractions, largely successful through Korea and the Cuban Missile Crisis, even though it wasn't totally successful, it was on the whole more successful than it was a failure. Here we have in Vietnam evidence that in this case, in Vietnam, the policy of containment was an utter and complete failure. And you can say that if the policy of containment was American policy in the years 1949 
19, or 1947 to 1975, the American policy of containment eventually fails, even though it had been successful in the start. Th things to think about um, uh, as you approach the questions for this topic. And that's it for this topic.